Today we're going to talk about a really big idea in mathematics, and that is sorting mathematical objects into sameness and differentness. So in other words, what we'd like to determine is given any two objects when they are the same and when they are different. But that's a really broad idea. And in fact, this really broad idea depends on what context we're interested in at the moment. So let's, for instance, say we have objects A and B. So perhaps in context one, A and B are the same, whatever that means. Whereas in context two, A and B are different. So choosing the correct context for comparing objects in mathematics is like a really big part of modern mathematics. And where would there be a good place to learn about this stuff? Well, it would be in a course like Abstract Algebra. And in fact, I've got a full course on Abstract Algebra on the second channel, Math Major. And this course is ad-free, and it's ad-free because of our Patreons. If you wanna help us keep making all of that stuff on the second channel ad-free, consider joining the Patreon. Okay, so we're done with that plug, and now I'd like to talk a little bit about the things that we will need for our examples. And we're gonna do this very loosely without getting into super precise definitions or really looking at all of the necessary pieces of these definitions, but I think it's enough to get a broad look at what's going on. And if you wanna see those details, maybe look more into that course that I told you about. Okay, so let's say for our first context, we'll be comparing objects just as sets. And so sets are the same if they have equal cardinality. So the obvious measurement on sets would be the number of elements in a set. So that means we forget any other structure. So a set with four elements cannot be the same as a set with eight elements because they have a different number of elements but the number of elements in a set generalizes to the notion of cardinality for infinite sets. Well, the definition of sets being equinumerous or having equal cardinality actually comes down there to there being a one-to-one -one and onto function between those two sets. And that's what I have here. So this is maybe the more careful way of saying that sets have equal cardinality. There is a bijection from A to B. In other words, a one-to-one -one and onto correspondence. Okay, so for our second context, we'll look at groups. And so groups are sets with a single operation. And for our examples, that operation will either be addition or multiplication, but there could be more operations if you broaden your examples that you are looking at. And in this case, for groups to be the same, the correspondence that we have taking sets to be the same also must respect the operation. And we'll see exactly what that means as we look at our examples. And then finally, for context three, we'll look at something called a ring. And a ring is a set with two operations, addition and multiplication. And here, the correspondence that we have showing that the two sets have equal cardinality must also respect both operations. Okay, so now that we have our setup, let's maybe look at several examples of sets that have operations and filter them into sameness and differentness depending on these contexts. Okay, so the working examples that we'll look at today will be the integers. So recall that's all positive and negative whole numbers together with zero. This set, which I'll call 2z, that's all even integers. So that's like negative four, negative two, zero, two, four, and then in both directions. That, that's how you could easily enumerate all even integers. Then next we would have z cross z. So that would be all ordered pairs of integers. Next we would have the rational numbers. Next we would have the rational numbers except for zero. So in other words, the non-zero rational numbers. Maybe the standard notation for that is to put a little times symbol up here. 
So next we'll have the real numbers. This is R cross R, so like two dimensional real numbers. This is R with the times up there, that's all non-zero real numbers. And then finally, the complex numbers. So now let's look at each of these as sets. And in fact, all of these sets are infinite. That's pretty easy to see. And we can filter them into countably infinite and uncountably infinite. Now, of course, there are different flavors of uncountably infinite, but every set up here that's uncountably infinite has the same size, which we won't prove here. That's a little bit outside of the scope of our goal. So that means everything in this countable column will be the same. So that would be like context one, they're the same. And everything in this uncountable column will also be the same. So in that, that's our context one here. But countable sets and uncountable sets don't have the same number of elements. So they are not the same. Okay, so anyway, let's get to it. So our countable sets. So it's well known that the integers are countable. You could maybe just list them in this way to see that they're countable. Zero, one, negative one, two, negative two. And now there's the, like this clear list that gives you an assignment to the natural numbers. Then even integers are also countable. We could perform a similar listing of that to see that those are countable. So zero, two, negative two, uh, four, negative four, and so on and so forth. And then it's well known that z cross z is also countable. So I won't sketch out that proof, but that's pretty easy to find online. Also, the rational numbers are famously countable. You can prove that, for instance, with Cantor's diagonal argument. But if the rational numbers are countable, then if you take one element away, well, it's still infinite and it's also countable. So the rational numbers except for zero are also countable. Okay, so all of those are countable. So in terms of sets, we consider those as being the same. Now, what about our uncountable sets? Well, that's everything else. So that would be like R, and then R cross R is also uncountable. R times, which is every non-zero real number, is also uncountable. And then finally, the complex numbers are also uncountable. And like I said, these are all the same size as each other. They're equal cardinality, but you know we won't argue that. Okay, so now we've got a list of sets that are the same here and another list of sets that are the same here. But each of these lists are different. So now let's restrict our view a little bit. So instead of looking at sets, which don't have any structure at all, let's look at groups, which are sets with structure. And I think what we'll see is that some things are still the same, whereas some things are different. So as we restrict our view to groups, let's introduce a little bit of the technicalities in the background. So we say that groups G1 and G2 are the same. The word here is isomorphic, and this is the symbol. If and only if we have a bijection between them, we'll call that bijection phi. And like I said before, that bijection or that correspondence was the language before, must respect the group operation. So let's say the group operation for G1 is star one, whereas the group operation for G2 is star two. Then what we really need to happen is that phi of A star one B is the same thing as phi of A star two phi of B. So that's what I mean by respecting this operation. It doesn't matter if you combine elements before or after the mapping, you get the same thing. So let's start with two examples of things that are isomorphic. So let's look at z and 2z. And I think we can easily see that we have a clear bijection which takes n to two times n. So like I said, that's a clear bijection. It takes an integer and it multiplies that integer to, by two.
Now, let's check that it satisfies that rule over there. Keeping in mind that on the left and the right hand side, that operation is simply addition. So let's look at phi of m plus n. Well, by definition, that's two times m plus n. But then inside of the integers, we've got a distributive rule. So that's 2m plus 2n. But now that is indeed phi of m plus phi of n. But that's exactly what we needed to show to have this respect of our operation. So now let's look at this next one. So C, the complex numbers, is isomorphic to R cross R. And here the operation is again addition. And what should our map be? Well, let's recall that everything in the complex numbers is of the form a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers. And let's take this map to be a comma b where the addition happening over on the right-hand side is component-wise. And now let's just check that everything works. So let's maybe introduce some notation. Z is A plus BI, and let's say W is C plus DI. And let's notice that phi of Z plus W is equal to phi of A plus C plus B plus D times I. That's just from adding the real parts and the imaginary parts of Z and W. But now by the definition of our map, that will be the ordered pair A plus C comma B plus D. But then by component wise addition, that's the same thing as the, uh, the ordered pair A, B plus C, D. But likewise, that is phi of Z plus phi of W. Okay, so importantly, what we've shown is that as groups, Z and 2Z are isomorphic and R cross R and the complex numbers are isomorphic. So now let's pick some things from this list that are not isomorphic and check that. Okay, so let's recall as sets, Z and Z cross Z were the same. They had the same number of elements. But we're about to show that as groups, they are not the same. So in other words, there's no such bijection that does this action over here. So let's notice that we have addition as the operations on both sides, so that's good to keep in mind. So how are we gonna do this? Well, in fact, we're gonna do it by way of contradiction. So let's say by way of contradiction, suppose that we have an isomorphism, that's what one of these maps is called, from Z to Z cross Z. And I'll put a little twiddle over that arrow just to say that this is an isomorphism. That's standard notation. And now let's notice that phi of one, well, it must be in Z cross Z, so it must be of the form A comma B. Okay, but then also we know that phi is on to, which tells us that phi of N equals one zero has a solution. So I'll write that here, has a solution. But now let's see why there's a problem to that. Let's notice that one zero is the same thing as phi of n, but that's the same thing as phi of one added to itself n times. But since this is an isomorphism, it satisfies this rule. Addition is the same operation on both sides. So this is phi of one added to phi of one n times. But we know phi of one is a comma b. So this is simply a comma b added to itself n times. But that gives us n a times n b. Oh, but actually we're gonna see a pretty big issue here. Notice that n times a is equal to one. Let's maybe underline that in orange. That means that n is not equal to zero because if it were zero, we could not achieve a one there. But if n is not zero and n times b is zero, that means that b must be zero. So let's see, we know that b is equal to zero. Oh, but that tells us that phi of one is equal to um, a comma zero. But 
that's a problem, and I won't go through all of the careful details, but essentially this shows us that um, the ordered pair zero one is not achievable. That's because, because of this map right here, the second component will always be zero. But if that second component is always zero, we cannot achieve this zero comma one. But if we can't achieve that zero comma one, then it was not a bijection in the first place. Now, let's go ahead and look at this next one. Let's show that the multiplicative group, so let's point out that over here we have multiplication. The multiplicative group of rational numbers is not the same as the additive group of rational numbers. Well, we have to exclude zero over here on the left-hand side, but that's okay. Okay, so how, we could, how could we do this? Well, we know over here the identity is one because multiplying by one doesn't change anything. But over here the identity is zero because adding zero doesn't do anything. And then by a property that this type of map must have, we have zero equals phi of one. So you can show that maps that satisfy this rule always have to take the identity to the identity. Okay. But now let's re-express the number one as negative one times negative one. I think we can all agree that negative one times negative one is positive one. Okay, but now that this satisfies this red rule, keeping in mind that we have addition over here, this is gonna be phi of negative one plus phi of negative one. Oh, but look at that, that is two times phi of negative one. So we've got this equation, zero is the same thing as two times phi of negative one. That means that phi of negative one must be equal to zero. Oh, but now what do we have? We have phi of one and phi of negative one are both zero but we've got two numbers that are different that get mapped to the same thing, so that tells us that this is not one to one. So that means our map is not a bijection, which means this cannot be one of these isomorphisms, meaning that these groups are not the same. Okay, so now let's maybe restrict even further to the level of rings and look at those two groups that we showed were the same before and show that they are not the same as rings. So restricting our view even more, let's look at some of our previous examples at the level of rings. Remember, those were sets together with two operations, addition and multiplication. So for rings to be the same, we need a bijection between them, and then that bijection needs to satisfy the addition property and the multiplication property. So in other words, it has to preserve both of those operations or respect both of those operations. Okay, so what we will indeed show is that the two group examples that we had for isomorphic groups or groups that were the same are not the same at levels of rings. So let's start with this Z is not isomorphic to 2Z as rings, of course, because as groups they are the same. Okay, so let's say that we do have an isomorphism. So this is by way of contradiction. So I'll say that we do have an isomorphism which is phi from z to 2z. And we know that phi of one must be equal to something within 2z. We don't know what it is, but it has to be equal to something within 2z. But now we'll immediately see that we get a problem and it's fairly obvious where to look for the problem because we know everything is totally okay if we use addition, so we must have to use multiplication to find the problem. And that's exactly what we'll do. So notice that a squared is the same thing as phi of one quantity squared, but that's the same thing as phi of one times one, but that's phi of one, but that's a. Okay, so again, we just kind of brought the multiplication inside. But what does that tell us? That tells us that a squared equals a, but that means that a equals zero or a equals one. 
But notice that a cannot be equal to one because one is not an even number. So this is impossible. A cannot be equal to one. Oh, but that must mean that a is equal to zero. But then that's also problematic because now notice that phi of n is the same thing as phi of n times one, which turns into phi of n times phi of one, which is zero, which is zero. So that means everything gets mapped to zero. But if everything gets mapped to zero, then this cannot be one to one or on to. So that means this is not gonna be an isomorphism. These rings are not the same. Okay, so now let's look at our last example. Complex numbers are not the same as R cross R. And again, we're gonna assume that we do have a ring homomorphism or a ring isomorphism. We'll call it C and it goes to R cross R. And let's see what goes wrong here. So let's notice that I is for instance equal to one times I. And actually, even though I have it written in this order, to prove that something goes wrong, I'm gonna take my map to go in the opposite order. So let's suppose that we've got a map that makes everything work, in other words, is a ring isomorphism from R cross R to C. But now let's notice that in R cross R, we have the following situation. We have zero comma zero is one comma zero times zero comma one. That's just because we've got component wise multiplication here. Okay, well, how might that be a problem? Well, now we have zero must be equal to phi of zero comma zero, but that in turn is equal to phi of zero comma one times one comma zero. I guess like here I use the fact that the additive identity has to be mapped to the additive identity again. Okay, but then because this is a ring homomorphism, this is gonna be equal to phi of one zero, phi of zero one. Oh, but look at what we have here. We have two complex numbers. Remember that phi of one zero and phi of zero one are both complex numbers. And they multiply together to give you zero. That means one of them has to be equal to zero. So we have phi of one zero equals zero or phi of zero one equals zero. But both of those give us a problem because both of them tell us that this was not a one to one function. If phi of one zero is equal to zero, then phi of one zero is equal to phi of zero zero, but it's not one to one. Likewise, if phi of zero one equals zero, then the same kind of thing and you do not have a one-to-one -one function. So since we tried to start with an isomorphism and we failed, that means that these are not isomorphic as rings. Okay, before I leave you, I'd like to point out one more time that I've got a full course on abstract algebra where we do all of this type of stuff in much more detail. And that course, because of my lovely patrons, does not have any ads on it. And if you'd like to help us do that, if you're willing and able, we'd love to have you join the Patreon. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.